They said free food, so they have to not show up. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, that's made a beat, but yeah. Oh, sorry. No, where? Like a dollar time. I don't have much. I'm the best. I'm like, the This time was the Oh, I'm not like, 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 I'm I don't think I saw Who's your Who's your Who's your here today. Good evening and welcome to our all, welcome to all of you to Kapal's Washington Leadership Program. It's good to see a good number of people here in person today despite the rain that's outside that we enjoy getting over here today. My name is Denise Liu. I'm a board member for Kapal. Um, I've been on the board board of directors. This is my second year on the board and today I have the honor of moderating this conversation on AANHPI's in national security and international affairs, um, a little bit on the fringes of that subject. I have a special connection to national security and international relations as a US Air Force veteran. So a little louder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I, I was in the Air Force for 26 years. I retired as a colonel from the military. And um, I was a healthcare administrator, so didn't fight on the lines, but I, I was a, in the supportive role. And I am board certified and a lifetime fellow in the um, American College of Healthcare Executives, if any of you are in healthcare, and I could also talk about that. And I um, am past chair of the ACHE's Asian Healthcare Leaders Forum, which is um, an affinity group as part of the ACHE. After retiring from the military, I spent 10 years with Deloitte Consulting, supporting the military health system in a wide variety of different roles, supporting strategic planning, patient safety, um, high reliability organizations, um, and uh, quality. And I supported um, a wide number of projects and then tried to retire, but then I went back to work after a year, and I am currently working for a small consulting contract with a company called Cognizante, and we provide um, executive high reliability organization leader coaching for veterans health administration medical centers and their vision offices to help them in their journey to high reliability. For those unfamiliar with Kapal, we are a nonprofit that cultivates Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander public service leaders by providing formative professional experiences and growth opportunities through our annual public service scholarship and internship programs and a roundtable series, our mentorship program and sessions of 
this Washington Leisure Program at, like we're providing to, to you tonight. Washington Leisure Leadership Program is one of our signature free programs that introduces students to AA NHPI leaders in public service who can inform and inspire students in their own civic engagement. For a second year in a row, this summer's WLP series planning was led by a group of our recent scholar and intern alumni. All WLP sessions are recorded and live streamed on our YouTube page and will be available for later viewing afterwards, including the materials. Tonight's session, as I had mentioned, will be on AA and NHPIs in national security and international affairs. This session will revolve around AA and NHPI professionals working somewhere in the realm of national security and inter, international relations, and more broadly, how international affairs impacts our community. Topics of discussion include bridging AA and HPI identity while working in international affairs, impact of international programs, and the model minority myth. There will be an audience survey following the panel's discussion and panelists will respond to audience Q&A at the end. So hold your questions and write them down so we can uh, address them after the uh, formal portion. We will also invite attendees to stay after the session for a networking opportunity. We encourage you to follow and join our conversation tonight on social media using the hashtag, hashtag we are Kapal. Thank you to our speakers, our panel members this, this evening, for spending their time with us and to all of you for joining us. A very special thank you to our 2023 sponsors, the DC Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs, Moa Pia, and Comcast for making programs like tonight's possible at Kapal. And a tremendous thank you to Verizon for allowing us to hold our WLP session at your venue space here tonight. Another, another thank you to Bonafide Mass for donating their materials in kind for our WLP sessions. Before we move to our, into the panel discussion, I would like to introduce Ajay Kunapuli from Verizon to deliver opening remarks before the session. Ajay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Verizon Technology and Policy Center. So my name is Ajay Kanapoli, and I manage the center here in DC. So a few housekeeping items before we get started, just so you guys know, the bathroom right down the hall to my left. If you ever need to go at any point, you can just go find it right there. If you ever want water, we have a bevy station right around the back corner on the left side. Please encourage you to go get some. And as time permits, I encourage you to explore our showcase area around the, uh, after the program. So if you, come if you want to come find me at any point, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about the technologies we showcase. I promise you they're very fun and interesting. So since you're here in the Verizon office today, I want to give you a bit of background on the company. While it may feel like Verizon has been around forever, the company was only formed in the year 2000. Now, granted, that may have been when many of you were born, but it's really not that long ago. Nonetheless, the company has undergone a lot of change and development in the last two decades. Today, it's a world leader in wireless technology, fiber optics, cybersecurity, and much more. Verizon serves roughly 130 million customers per month and maintains one of the most robust internet networks on the globe, touching 140 different countries. In accordance with its scale and influence, Verizon has felt a responsibility to be a social advocate. As a major producer of goods, we aim to be conscious of diversity across our supply chain, spending $5 billion a year in procurement from women and minority owned businesses. Verizon was one of the first companies to publicly call for comprehensive immigration reform and was a staunch supporter of DACA. In 2020, Verizon denounced the rise in anti-Asian hate, committing to $15 million to accelerate social justice across the Asian community. This included providing funding to leading organizations on the front lines of advancing AAPI racial equality, media ad inventory advocating for Asian rights and mental health, and promotion of small businesses across the AAPI community. Verizon has enjoyed expansive relationships with many leading AAPI advocacy groups, 
including Asian Americans Advancing Justice, APIA Vote, OCA, Asia, Asian Pacific American Advocates, and of course, Kapal. We at Verizon are delighted that you're here today and hope that you'll find the discussion to be both educational and inspiring. Working in DC for the summer is a really exciting opportunity, and we hope that experiences like this one will make your summer as meaningful as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Okay, now let's give a warm welcome to our panelists tonight, David Inoue. He is the Executive Director of Japanese American Citizens League. Tanya Harris-Joshua, Deputy Director of Technology Assistance Programs at the Office of Insular Affairs. And Metha Gargaya, she is a government attorney and also an Air Force Reservist. Now I'll allow you to introduce yourselves. Do you want to start, Metha? Hi, everyone. I'm Metha Gargaya. It is an immense honor to be here. Um, I remember being a Washington DC intern and had there been programming like this, I would have been in the front row asking a lot of annoying questions, um, but I would welcome any questions that you all have. Um, I currently work at the White House as one of the counsel to the vice president. Um, before that, I was working at a law firm. Um, in both these capacities, I'm focused on government litigation. Some of that does have an element of national security. Um, and my primary engagement with national security is as an Air Force reservist. Um, my career is far from as decorated or lengthy as Denise's. Um, I joined the reserves in 2020, um, and I went to my training programs in 2021 and 2022, uh, and, then and I'm navigating being a reservist in the armed services. Um, before that, um, I worked uh, as a clerk for a federal judge. Um, I've taught, and uh, I'm from North Carolina originally. Happy to be here. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, David Inouye. I'm the executive director for the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, 22 years ago, I guess I was in your place uh, when I first came to Washington, uh, D.C. Um, and I think Kapal is kind of just one of those things that everybody, when they first come to the city, uh, you kind of go through it, uh, if you're here in the summer at least. And I did move here during the summer. Um, I was actually kind of a little different because I'd actually already been working. I had worked for a couple of years and I already had a graduate degree. So I was a little bit older than probably most of you are uh, when you're here, here right now. Uh, but I can attest that um, the people you see in this room, you will continue to see throughout your time here in DC. Like I still see the people when I was participating in this program around the city today, even 20 plus years later. Um, I did also want to mention, uh, thank you to Verizon because JCL is actually also a uh, beneficiary of Verizon support. Um, so thank you. Um, my background is that um, I'm actually, uh, similarly, I have a healthcare background. Um, I was a member of ACHV many years ago, did not quite advance as far as Denise did, but um, it is another great organization to be a part of. Um, I worked in healthcare policy when I first came here to Washington, D.C., um, um, doing uh, policy analysis for the public hospitals, and then I also worked at the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, for the past uh, six years, I've been at the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, where um, we work on a broad range of civil rights issues. Um, interestingly, we actually try and shy away from doing international affairs or international policy. Um, but we find that we often are pulled into things because of the intersection of being Japanese American, um, that it's kind of um, unavoidable oftentimes. Uh, so that's what I'll probably talk a little bit about later on as we get into this conversation. My name is Tanya Joshua. I'm here from the Office of Insular Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior, not a foreign affairs or the State Department. But I did start out my personal career with the, with the Micronesia government, which is where I grew up uh, in Micronesia. And uh, when I was growing up, it was a trust territory, uh, so a different status. And then once I moved into college and graduated, it was changing into an independent country, the islands where I grew up in. So I'll probably touch on that a little as we go. 
but I do work in the uh, Department of the Interior in a very small office that manages the funds, a lot of funding uh, that Congress gives us every year to go to the U.S. territories of American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, and then three Pacific Island nations, which are the Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. So uh, that's where the that's where we touch a little bit on international relations, and we work closely with the State Department uh, on managing the funds as well as uh, the relationship that we hold with those Pacific Island nations. Uh, I've been in DC for about 20 years. I actually think that I crossed paths with David at somewhere along the way. DC becomes uh, a, a small family. You start to know the different people who work in your area and on the issues that you work on. He mentioned a, a colleague that he met with this morning that I've known from, from other parts of my work. So, so DC can become a, a small place and you start to get to know people. They start to get to know you. So it really is a very big networking city. And uh, anyway, I'm happy to be here. I'm joined by my sons who are uh, Tamsin and Judah, thank you for coming today. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to the panel. Okay, thank you. So why don't we start with a general question about what drew you into the work that you currently do um, and made that maybe something close to what drew you into the military, why you wanted to join? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think from a pretty young age, I wanted to pursue the law. I didn't know what that would look like. I had just seen like courtroom dramas on TV and thought that might be the most exciting way or way to, the most kosher way to get excitement into my life <laughs> um, with Asian American parents. Um, so I, I was interested in law and I realized a lot of really interesting legal questions live in the government. Um, you know, focusing on what the government can and can't do, thinking about our constitution and uh, our bill of rights. Um, and so that was where my interest really developed uh, through college and law school. Um, I thought about joining the military from a pretty young age, but frankly, I wasn't physically fit enough to make that like a serious commitment <laughs> um, uh, throughout my, my, my uh, high school years. I really wanted to apply to a service academy, but I couldn't run a mile. So um, I, I applied elsewhere, um, but I reaffirmed that interest uh, when I was clerking, my judge, um, he served in the army um, and getting to have conversations with him about what public service in that capacity meant to him was really meaningful to me. And I realized I did like legal practice. And so I thought about what are ways that I could bring my interest in the law to the military. And so it seemed like the judge advocate general program, the JAG program um, was the most ready way to do that in terms of applying to different branches. Um, Frankly, the Air Force had the fewest push-up requirements, and so that was what made me <laughs> think that the, the Air Force might be the easiest way to go. Um, but in retrospect, you know, it is just an honor to serve, and I would have applied to, to any of the branches. Um, it just, I got pretty lucky. I applied once, and I was rejected, and then I thought about applying again um, to the Air Force, and um, that's, that's kind of my path towards public service in that capacity. Thank you. And David, you've done a variety of different things. What drew into the work? First, um, you know, your work with the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus at one point, and then also um, in grassroots and government relations with the National Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems, and then finally with the Japanese American Citizens League. What, what drew you into those types of roles? Uh, so I'd actually kind of describe myself as an accidental Asian. Um, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was pretty much the only Asian face at my school. Um, there was myself in elementary school. So there was myself and my sister for the longest time. And then I think it was when I was maybe in sixth grade, there was a kid who moved into the neighborhood who was um, half Japanese, half Caucasian. Um, and then I went off to uh, middle school and there was an, someone a year ahead of me who was Asian. Everyone thought that I was him. It's like, no, that's the guy that plays the violin. I do not play any musical instrument. Um, and there was another guy the year after me and everyone thought that he was me. So was, um, that was kind of what I grew up with. Um, I went off to college. Um, and one of the things I did want to do when I was in college was actually learn Japanese and Chinese. Um, I'm a mixed uh, Japanese Chinese um, heritage. Um, did okay with the Japanese, failed miserably with the Cantonese, um, but was kind of following the sort of stereotypical Asian student path though. 
um, and actually went to medical school straight out of undergrad. Um, once I got into medical school, though, I sort of really got more involved with the APA community at um, Ohio State, where um, I went to medical school, um, because I had been in a college where there were a lot more Asians, and then suddenly I'm at, back in Ohio State, where there were not a lot. Um, so I um, became very involved with a lot of um, with the Asian American Medical Student Group, doing things like uh, community health fairs, uh, hypertension screenings, um, doing more community work, basically, working out in the Asian American community. Um, and that kind of pulled me away from the whole med school part of it and thinking more about the community part of it. Um, and then eventually I focused a little bit too much on that other stuff and the medical school kind of asked me to leave. Um, in other words, I failed out. Um, so I was kind of left with like, well, what do I do now? And I realized, well, there's a lot more I can do. Being a doctor, you can help your one patient that you're meeting with at a time. If I go into healthcare policy, I can make a bigger change. Um, so I actually entered the School of Public Health and Health Administration, uh, got a dual degree in public health and um, health administration with a focus on health policy, um, and basically was working in Asian American health issues. Um, so that that's what brought me here to Washington, D.C., um, worked, um, like I said, at the Public Hospital Association on broader issues of uh, healthcare access, not just for APAs, but um, public hospitals obviously serve everybody. And that's kind of the whole point of why we have public hospitals. Um, that then led me, um, as I was doing that, I wanted to actually get back more into the direct service side of things. So I managed the medical shelter for the homeless, uh, where I started to sort of see more of the intersection of um, other socioeconomic issues, obviously homelessness and healthcare then were kind of the intersection. Um, and, and it sort of broadened my perspective of, yeah, it's not just healthcare and healthcare as a civil right. How does that relate to homelessness and um, equity um, around other issues? Uh, so after several years of doing that, um, the position at JCL came open and it was sort of the well, now we can actually do even more, um, expanding that whole civil rights portfolio beyond healthcare, beyond homelessness, and now working on more issues of racial equity and uh, racial justice. So um, at JACL, um, it's not just issues for Japanese Americans, but uh, one of the big things we focus on is um, black reparations um, because of, actually there is that direct uh, correlation between Japanese Americans achieved redress um, for what happened during World War II. And now we're 35 years out from when that happened um, with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. And every year since then, we've been trying to get a bill for a similar study on African American reparations, and that has gone nowhere. So um, we feel that it's we're well, well past the time that we need to be doing this, um, doing this for the Black community. Uh, so that's one of our priority issues. So um, I guess I see, sort of see my career as just sort of like that broadening and just enlarging that circle of uh, where's my focus um, uh, around civil rights. Thank you, David. And Tanya, what drew you into the government of, in Micronesia and then also landing you finally in Insular Affairs as part of the Department of Interior? Um, when I first came to college in the United States, I was very interested in politics. That's actually where I took most of my classes, uh, you know, war, Vietnam War, China history. So I ended up majoring in politics. So it wasn't really a, a guided decision, but sort of landed where I was interested. Uh, and then I went back to Micronesia. Micronesia, uh, small islands, so there's it's either private sector or government, so there's a lot of government. Um, I actually did try out private sector with my my father and mother who were doing a small fish uh, fish store, and we tried to do some local kind of import export just in the region in the Pacific. Uh, but then I was roped into the Department of Foreign Affairs, and that brought me eventually to the Embassy of Micronesia. Uh, and I wanted to say that I never imagined that I would be working for the United States government because I grew up in the islands and I always felt that they needed me more than the huge United States government would ever need me. Um, so my mother is American and my dad is Pacific Islander. So I have that both, you know, both backgrounds. Um, but it, when I was here in D.C., uh, you know, after six years working at the Embassy of Micronesia, uh, 
an opportunity arose and it was a really hard decision to make. But one of the driving reasons for my taking the position in the U.S. government was that I felt the U.S. government needed help. Uh, they needed some perspective that they didn't have. You know, there are very few Pacific Islanders in, uh, in fact, there are less than 1% of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders in the entire American population. So uh, in the government, you can imagine there's probably not very many. And yet we had funding going to the Pacific. We have, you know, relationships in the Pacific. So uh, that was one of my, the draws that drew me to that was wanting to be a part of uh, helping to, to formulate decisions and policies and uh, influence decisions around the relationship with the Pacific. So that's a little bit of how I landed where I did. Wonderful, thank you. So any of you, um, can you comment on how you think your work influences some of the communities around us? I know, actually, David, you kind of started more, uh, talking about that. Yeah, and, I, and actually, I think I mean, when you mentioned Pacific Islanders also, and when we talk about an Asian American community, how are Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians included in that community? And I think that's one of the challenges that we all face, um, particularly now, um, particularly for like a JCL, when people think of Asian American, oftentimes the first thought is Japanese, Chinese, Korean, East Asian. Um, now it's starting to expand Indian, Southeast Asian, but oftentimes Pacific Islanders are left out. And where, do, where does that fit into our own community? So I think when we talk about um, our community, we have to look at how, or how do we interact with other communities? We, have, we even have to look in, internally within our own AANHPI community and how do we make sure that we're inclusive um, when we talk about who we are even. Um, but yeah, it is also important, how do we reach out to other communities that um, I think one of the lessons for Japanese Americans coming out of World War II um, is that when the incarceration happened, um, the only national organization that stood up and said, this is wrong, were the Quakers. Um, now, I've probably have not been around DC too long, but you can probably guess the Quakers are not the most powerful lobbying organization in the city. Um, the ACLU, NAACP, um, the unions, actually the unions were supportive of incarceration because um, a lot of it was because of uh, economic issues that, hey, if we take these people off of the labor market, that's better for our members. Um, so one of the things that the Japanese American community realized very quickly was, we need to be in solidarity with other groups because we need their support. Um, so that's why Japanese Americans very early joined the civil rights movement. We're part of the March on Washington, which um, actually this year will be the 60th anniversary of that event. Um, so I'm founding the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And these are the things that um, very early on the Japanese Americans sort of realize we need to get involved in this. And I think where you see it um, more recently, um, for example, with the Muslim ban in the previous administration, um, it didn't just happen. You had thousands of people going out to the airport and saying this is wrong. And I think that's the great thing that has really changed is that um, for those of us who are people of color, we recognize the need to be working together and, and to find that solidarity to get things done. I wanted to, if I could, just jump off of that really quickly. Um, I wanted to, first of all, say thank you to the JACL because actually in Hawaii, there are some issues with um, integration of Pacific Islander communities that, that are, you know, the, the term is, is impact. There's part of the term is impact, but that's the only term I'll use. But, but the, the JACL has been very active in Hawaii for, for working with, with communities, including the Pacific Islander communities, to, to sort of help help, you know, ease things. Uh, so, so, so I can testify. Yes, I can testify to that. Um, I wanted to just add about communities and, and awareness. One of the things that when I first came to DC in the year 2000 was I, I was just surprised that people were not aware of how many Islanders were in the military and people just had no idea. And, and so I didn't know numbers and I tried to, to get numbers from DOD, but couldn't and, and understandably so. Uh, but what I started to do was tell anecdotes. And my anecdote was, if I go to Micronesia or the Pacific Islands and I talk to, uh, you know, my uncle's relatives, you will, there will be always be somebody who has served in the military. 
you will always bump into somebody who has served in the military or who has a connection. But if I'm, you know, comparatively, if I'm in the United States, you can go into a population and select a group and that you will bump into people who have not served or who have not had that service connection. So that was my way. Maybe it's a creative or a sly way of trying to, to, to bring some awareness to, to something that was happening. I thought it was important for decision makers in the, in the Washington DC area to be aware of that fact about Pacific Islanders. And now 23 years later, that's actually much more well-known. So I'm very pleased that that has transpired. But now, you know, you have to make sure that you're not only tied to that story, but that you're, you're, there's a larger story and it's not just that. But sometimes you do need to draw into communities on those touch points where you do have some commonality. So um, I just thought of that story and, and maybe this is my way of just kind of saying aloha to, to my Pacific Islanders who do serve in large numbers. And, you know, yes, um, I think there's more awareness of all A and HPI contributions to the US military that hasn't been previously recognized. Um, and Meta, um, in your role, you said, you kind of mentioned that in your White House role, you do have a little of a peripheral influence on international relations and national security. Can you comment on that? Sure, I probably can't comment too much, um, but um, we, a lot of what, you know, we work on a range of different policy areas. I'd say a lot of the international affairs work lives with those teams, um, the National Security Council and others. Um, but in, when I thought about this question, um, it's obviously extremely inspiring to hear everyone's stories and, and their direct work influencing the AAPI community. For me, what I immediately thought of was like serving the broader American population and good governance. So my focus is on ethics and oversight, um, which does have national security ramifications in terms of safe uh, practices regarding information and classified information and presidential records and things like that. Um, and so that's what a lot of my work lives in. Um, thinking also about national security more broadly, I think there's a lot of uh, attention, especially when you live in a place like DC, about national security, not only meaning something with international implications, but also in terms of, um, you know, things like classified practices, um, but also uh, like separation of powers and checks and balances um, and thinking about how to keep, you know, um, government power secure um, and ensuring that uh, there, there are not, you know, any any branch trying to out outdo one another, um, so that's probably how my work most directly relates to that. I'd like to know um, how do you bridge your personal identities? Um, it it seems like ha what 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 influences your personal identity enhance your role in what you do. I'm happy to start because I'm <laughs> something immediately came to mind. Um, I think the identity question is an interesting one, and and um, I thought it was really interesting when you said that you know you were the only, you and your sister were were primarily the, the representation that you experienced growing up. The same was for me. So I think when I think about identity, um, I think of myself as a southerner. I grew up in North Carolina. I still go back very very often. Um, I think of myself as a service member. That's a new identity that I'm slowly trying to adopt. I, I think that representation for me feels like at a macro and micro level. So in terms of a micro level, it means doing things to support, endorse, and mentor um, other Asian Americans, Asian um, young women, uh, groups like that, people from the South or people who are first-gen professionals, things like that. Um, and that's what I feel in terms of representation on a micro level. But in terms of a macro level, I think that it gives you a unique perspective to think about how someone who does not have access to these systems of power is better able to access government resources or what communication means or better um, framing how people are able to understand their legal rights. So that's maybe something that I think feeling like I'm from the outside and getting closer to uh, being involved in government in those processes is I've really tried to bring that with me. Uh, to sort of bring this to the sort of our topic today of international affairs, um, I think one of the challenges for anyone who is identifies as Asian American is that you are sort of in that intersection of are you American or are you from that Asian ethnicity that you represent? Um, and I, and this is something obviously for me growing up in particular, I struggled with when I was younger. Um, and it really kind of drove home for me when I was, um, I think I was about 10 years old um, with the murder of Vincent Chin. Um, because to me, 
that was sort of the crystallization of here I am, half Japanese, half Chinese. And here was this man who was murdered, a Chinese American, murdered because uh, his murders thought that he was Japanese. Um, and to me, that was sort of the, yeah, it doesn't matter whether I'm half Chinese, half Japanese. Um, I mean, people, would, I mean, whether they call me a chink or a Jap, I, it doesn't matter to them. It's the same thing. Um, but for me, I had always sort of differentiated, like, well, am I, Jap am I more Japanese or am I more Chinese, depending on which, um, what my parents were feeding me or whatever at the time. But this really did make it make me realize that there really isn't a difference for me as an Asian American. Um, and I think today we're seeing this sort of rise up again with um, what's going on with uh, some of the anti-China sentiment that we've experienced for the last couple of years. Um, and how do we um, fit into that sort of dynamic? And how obviously it impacts us in the way that other people see us um, and how we've been targeted as a community. Um, but also, does this also give us an opportunity too to perhaps try and bridge some of that understanding? Um, and how do we do that? And that's one of the challenges that I think the Japanese American community has particularly felt. Um, coming out of World War II, a lot of Japanese Americans pretty much rejected anything that would have made them Japanese. Um, and I'm actually, um, I don't have any connection to the incarceration experience. Uh, my family's actually, my Japanese side is more recent immigration. My Chinese side goes back before the war. <laughs> Um, but a lot of people coming out of the war um, from the camps were like, I don't want to have anything in my house that makes me identify as Japanese. I don't want to eat Japanese food. Don't want to speak Japanese because that's what put me into the camps. And um, I, there's now a uh, obviously a change in our community that JCL, we actually do start, we've started to work with the Japanese government because of going back to things like Vincent Chin, because of the recognition that that's, um, Obviously, if things are bad between Japan and the United States, that means that things are going to be bad for Japanese Americans and our fellow Americans as well. So um, it's, it's a very, it's a tightrope that we're walking as a community, but it is a tightrope we need, we need to be walking because it does impact us. Incredible. Thank you. I just wanted to share that I, uh, there's a book I read recently, two books actually, that uh, that are very heartbreaking. One is about the last Comanche chief. I, I recommend it. It's the life of Quana Parker. And he's the last Comanche chief. The book talks about the Comanche. Uh, his mother was actually white, a white woman, and he's Native American. And uh, it's just a fascinating story. It's the changing of times. And, you know, so, so I just, I, I commend it to you, but it, there's a lot of identity issues in that whole story. Um, and it was very helpful to me to, to also read that because uh, I do similar things of, you know, do I stay here? Do I go back? Do I, you know, where do I go? Uh, and then another book I would commend to you is, um, since I'm on the, the, <laughs> the book thing, is it's called How to Hide an Empire. And it's uh, How to Hide an Empire. Uh, it's, it talks about the territories and how they are connected to the United States, how they are seen, how they are not seen, how they are seen when it's convenient. Um, and, and they talk also, you know, because back way in the long ago, the large empires were, were seeking islands and, you know, grabbing them up to, to, to expand their territories. Uh, and, and that has, you know, that has trend, that's changed somewhat, um, but, but that's, it's the history of that. And uh, so, it's another sort of touch on, you know, identity of a nation, who we are as a nation. And are the territories part of us, the islands, or are they not? And, and why are they? And when are they? And are there times when they're not? So that would be, I would commend to you another book to read uh, that, that, that talks about that. So building on this, how do you feel, what, what do you, how can you comment on how it's important to have AANHPI represented in our, in public service? That's why we're all here is trying to encourage more um, representation in government, why that's important. If I could, I'll, I'll give a small example, uh, um, but decisions are made every day in the government with rules and regulations and policies that, that affect people in the islands, that affect people here in America. Uh, so I think it's important to be a part of 
those decision-making processes as much as you can. Uh, and if you're not even a part of decision, you don't always have to be a part of the actual decision, but even sharing your voices and sharing your experiences, I think can help to sometimes help people see things that they might not have seen before. Uh, and one small example, one small example that I uh, will share, it's kind of current, is uh, conservation. Sometimes you have conflicts between issues and in the islands, there will be conservation issues where there's a restriction of fishing, say of say sea turtles. But culturally for the people in the islands, they've been fishing turtles for, for, for hundreds of years. So now you, you have a conflict and, and you need to hear the people's stories. Of if decisions are just being made in Washington, far away from where these places are, you need to make sure that, that those voices are also heard and that some perspective is, is shared. So that's where I would, I think, as much as you can share your perspective uh, because it can make a difference with uh, those who make the decisions. So I'm gonna steal someone else's story to kind of illustrate this. Um, and when we talk about sharing your story with people, um, Secretary Norman Mineta used to be a mainstay of this program. I mean, he would meet with the uh, all participants every summer. Um, unfortunately, he passed away last year. Um, but one of the stories he talks, he would always talk about was um, 9-11, um, when obviously there was a, a fear of uh, the Muslim backlash because of what had happened. Um, and one of the things that President Bush at the time said was, because I know of Norm's story of what happened to him during World War II, I will make sure that we will, that will not happen to Muslims today. Um, and, and Norm just sort of talks about how the fact that the president knew that story and he didn't even expect that that was going to be mentioned or talked about at all, but that the president knew about that story of what had happened with the incarceration and knew that we did not want to repeat that history um, was, was so important. Um, so that's where sharing your story, you don't know how it could impact somebody, but um, it, it does. And it does come up obviously in some of the highest levels of government sometimes. That's extremely powerful. Um, I was thinking about representation in terms of just being there in the room, being a reminder, your presence being something that people are able to focus on. I was also thinking about contributions that you can substantively make. Um, one thing that I feel like I, when I talk to young law students or college students, I feel like maybe people are more thoughtful about what government means um, in your life. And with that, I think comes a real reckoning of like, when has government been negative towards the Asian Pacific Islander community. And talk, we've already talked about a couple of episodes. Um, and I, I personally struggle with thinking about like institutions that I'm not 100% comfortable with, but joining them and thinking about how to make it better from the inside and whether that's actually something that one can do. Certainly, Denise, like I'm sure that we can cite a number of things that have happened in the military that have been things that maybe if we were in charge, we would not have done or we're not comfortable with the way that things were executed. Um, but every time I talk to my mentors, when I talk to other folks in public service, they said that there's a real importance with good people, people who are thinking about others beyond them um, in taking on these roles. And so for me, I think representation is not just about your direct experiences or your contributions, but about people who look like us, talk like us, or um, people who you can be an ally to, um, people who may be more marginalized or may have had different experiences, but ones that you think should also be brought to the table. Um, so I would encourage, you know, if you have the opportunity to serve, and maybe this goes into our what we're going to be talking about next, um, thinking about just what what your impact could be. Yeah, I was wondering also, you know, did you ever run into a, a challenge or an obstacle and how did you overcome it? Like what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who runs into something that kind of feels like a, like a, that's a barrier to what you want to achieve? I mean, just like broadly in terms of career advice and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. <laughs> no, my camera's hot or my, my mic's hot. Um, I think it's hard. I think it's also something that like you kind of need to be successful, to learn some degree of grit. And so I know that's not something I would have wanted to hear when I was in college um, or even yesterday. Like it's always hard to swallow that pill that sometimes failure does make you um, stronger, but you slowly 
um, start to think about ways to build yourself back up. Um, for me, um, I think my first thing is to think about, okay, well, what can I think about next? Um, so this didn't work out, but like opportunities um, are, are many. And so I usually try to think about what can I focus on next? Um, it's harder for me and that this may be something that I'm just grappling with, um, but also being Asian American, thinking about my own successes and what like brought me here is harder for me. So that's not something I typically do. Usually it's what can I do next that will make me like proud of myself. And maybe that's not healthy, but I'm just being very honest about how I approach it. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I failed out of med school. <laughs> Uh, you don't you don't hit rock bottom much more than that. Um, I guess the thought that basically the assumption is once you get into med school, you're all you're set. You're gonna you're gonna graduate. You're gonna become a doctor. Very few people fail out, um, and I was that like one percent that probably less than one percent that did that. Um, but the thing is, um, you, you find out where, where your real passion is, um, and don't be afraid. We were talk, talking earlier about um, or no. Didn't, Denise, you and I were talking about like taking a, a break, like a year off or something after school, um, doing things like that to really understand what it is that you want to be doing and what makes you happy. Um, it's not all about being happy all the time either. There are times where work is not going to be all that you want it to be. Um, and it's, it's fighting through that as well. Um, so life is a struggle and you're going to Hopefully, no one's going to fail as miserably as I did that one time. Um, but you just find what's what's good, and, and sometimes taking that break. Um, what I did when I dropped out of med school is I made sushi for a year, um, and I worked at a Japanese restaurant. Um, I'd actually I'd already started working at it while I was in med school, actually, and that should have been the signal that yeah, I wasn't focusing on med school enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, I became one of the best sushi chefs in Columbus, Ohio <laughs> at one point, um, and I worked there throughout graduate school. Um, People ask me, do you want to maybe open up a restaurant sometimes? Like, hell no. That's the other thing I learned. I absolutely do not want to be running a restaurant uh, from that experience. Um, but it's having that diversity of experience also that really uh, makes you interesting as well as a person, I think, um, and be able to handle diverse problems that might come your way. Um, I think the other thing uh, for the, the few of us who are the, those of us up here who do have children, that's another thing that is going to create so many challenges in your life. I and mean, how do you prioritize your career versus your family? Um, and um, I think it's the great thing is it's changing now that for me as a man, 20 years ago, it probably would have been a very different calculus that it probably would have been more, oh, my wife will just handle this and I can, I'll continue to go to work. But now uh, we have to make those decisions about what is, how, how are we as a couple going to be managing this? Um, and um, I think that'll, the, those types of decisions are going to be the other things that are going to both enrich, but also challenge you in your life. Maybe I'll just add uh, that when you face, I think sometimes in my work, in terms of facing challenges, if I was trying to advocate for something or, or the islands, because very few people knew about the islands, still don't, but um, is sometimes you're very alone. So I think that's important to, to come to terms with and just focus on, what is, what, is, what is it that I'm trying to do? And you may not have a lot of allies. And when you do find allies, I think those allies are very important to, to hold on to and to work with. And they may not be the allies that you expect that they're going to be. And um, I forget, I think his name is Sisyphus, pushing the rock up the hill. It's usually that's the hardest part is pushing the rock up the hill. But then once it starts to go over the hill, then, and then all the advocates come and join you. But uh, I think sometimes when you're working alone, just remember to focus and um, use the allies that you that you can have uh, that who are there for you, who might be the most surprising of all allies. And I would say just um, keep patience and just it's we're in it for the long haul. And David, you're right. Life is life is a struggle. And sometimes when we when I have the opportunity to sit down and and join folks on a panel, it, it kind of reminds me, like, oh yeah, it's it's been good. There have been some wins. There've been some struggles, but there have been some wins. And so it's good to take the time off to do things like this and, and share with, with others that are around you. That's what we actually, uh, we're, we're always telling our 10 year old because 
we'll ask him, well, how was your day? And he always focuses on the negative things. And it's like, well, what, what good happened today? And, and you, you do have to find the good. Yeah, yeah, building on those comments, what drives you? Do you even being here today and, and wanting to pass on your experiences to the future? Um, and, and I know that I went through um, an experience where I was asked to speak at a, at a women's um, month celebration. And I, and I was like, well, why would it be me? I was like, because you're the senior ranking person. It's like, oh, then I did not ask to be a role model or uh, take that, that role. Um, and I was a little bit intimidated by it. But, but then when you realize what influence you can make on other people, what, what drives you? to um, be in this type of role and to give back to the community? For me, it's that I think I gained a lot from other people paying it forward. For me, I asked so many questions. I had so many office hours that I went to, random cold emails and phone calls. And so the extent I can ever be helpful, please let me know. Um, I think the other thing that drives me is that unlike other professions, my brother's an investment banker. It seems like there's a clear you know, line of progression on what he's going to do probably for the next 15 years. I think public service is a little different um, and it really makes you interrogate your values um, and what drives you. And that's hard. Um, it's hard to constantly confront like things that are socially fraught that people care about a lot because you care about it a lot. And so that I think can be exhausting. And so I think something that you both were touching on is like, for me, the importance of building community. When I fall down, I immediately call the people who I know will kind of tell me, okay, Maida, but this is what you should think about next. Or, um, you know, you still care about X, Y, and Z. That doesn't vitiate. And what just happened doesn't vitiate any of that. And so that I think having that community is really, really important. Um, and so in terms of, you know, thinking about navigating public service, you could be practicing in a range of different places. You could be, your day-to-day -day could be very, very different over the next 10, 15, 50 years. Um, and so to the extent that, talking about my path can be helpful. That's why I, I tried to do stuff like this. It is baffling to me that my path can be helpful, but I think just from series of diversity and hearing how different paths can work, um, that's, that's yeah, what drives me. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I started out saying that 22 years ago, I was sitting where you are now. Um, and, and that's why now it's it's kind of amazing that I am the one up here. Actually, it's uh, twenty years ago. I would not have expected that I would be sitting the one sitting up here and talking to you all. Um, I don't see myself as a role model. I see, like you said, that I had a path that I followed, and it was not the path I necessarily expected. Um, but I hope that that can sort of be an example of the fact that, yeah. You, things don't always go the way that you're going to expect them to for the next 20, 30 years. Uh, I obviously, I think when anyone comes to Washington, D.C., you have a lot of aspirations that, yeah, I did expect to be in this type of a role at some point. Um, I didn't know when it was going to happen, but yeah, I came to D.C. because I wanted to be able to be in a role like this where I can make a difference. Um, and that is, I think that's why you all are here as well, that at some point you want to be able to be making those decisions to be um, changing people's lives for the better. And, and that's why I think all of us are here today in this room. Uh, those are some great examples. I, I forgot the question. <laughs> why, what, why did we come, why, why are we here? Um, I think for, for me personally, because there are so few uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders anywhere I feel that I have a duty to just, uh, by no means am I a role model at all, but, but if I can share my story and if it can be helpful, then, then I'll, I'll show up and, and share it. And uh, I love at the very beginning that I'm able to say words from the island of Gonpe, an ancient island that very few people know about. The population is very small. Um, I wanna say that I think it's important we need to keep whatever is unique and special about you uh, also in this world, because otherwise it's, just, uh, it's, 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 it's I think we can all be the salt of the earth. We can all bring a certain salt to, 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 I saw the, a bumper sticker, stay salty. I was like, yeah, stay salty, <laughs> you know, and in this context, you know, we want everybody to, to, 
to, to, to retain their uniqueness and, and bring it forth. And one thing that I'll share about this Pompeian uh, greeting, uh, in the State Department, when you send a message from one country to another country, you always attach a dip note. It's called a diplomatic note. No uh, communication will go from one country to another without that dip note. And it says something to the effect of, you know, we extend our, you know, grace, most gracious, you know, greetings to you and hereby attach this message. And then the, whatever the message is follows. Um, that's what you do in Pompeii, in the island of Pompeii. It's a small island. Before you get up and say something, you always give that greeting of respect. And so I always think of that. I go, yeah, these guys had it. They knew it long ago. We need those kinds of, there are reasons for those kind of old traditions sometimes that other, many other cultures have different traditions that I think are important to bring and, and keep and share as you as you go about uh, and meet with other people. So thank you. David, I wanted to ask you a specific question about Organizations like JACL, what, why are those types of organizations important to government or, you know, to influence government decisions? Um, so JACL, we, we see our core mission as education, and it is education of policymakers, of legislators, of the administration, um, but also the public too. Um, and it is so that we remember our history but also make sure that we can make a better future. Um, so it is taking that history of what has happened to Japanese Americans, to Asian Americans, um, because so many of our stories do intersect throughout history um, and, and African American and Native American as well. Um, so it's important for us to exist, to be able to influence what happens because let's be honest, um, Part of why we're here is because diversity in government is still lacking, um, that we still need more faces that look like ours. And, and just because they look like ours doesn't mean they're going to think the same way as us either. Um, but that's also our role to make sure that we are promoting that as well. And um, it's not just in the government, it's also in corporations. It's why JCL does partner with Verizon, because we need to see more diversity in places like that as well, because a lot of decisions in this country are also made in corporations that um, it's not just the government. I, there are corporations bigger than governments now, um, a lot of them. <laughs> so um, it's, it's understanding how can we influence the decision makers and where that power might be. Thank you. And Tanya, how about talking about the importance of the territories in the island areas to national security? Um, so I did uh, mention to you the book, uh, How to Hide an Empire. And uh, during the Cold War, the islands were, uh, at, at that time, the, the competitors were the United States and Russia uh, over the island territories. Uh, in the history, they talk about uh, guano, which is bird, bird droppings, uh, once upon a time was from the islands and that was needed for farming industry here. Uh, and that changed when chemists were able to create alternatives to that guano and then also the, well, the guano ran out. Um, so there, are, there is actually one Pacific island I'm thinking of, Nauru, that their island is very much different now because of all the extraction. Um, so, so things change, national security issues change. The islands now are, are it's, they're in a competition. Well, there is, so there's the United States government versus the Chinese government kind of controversies right now that the Pacific is involved in, uh, Pacific Islands specifically. Uh, so so I, I don't wanna go too far into that, but, but you, know, you can read a little bit about that in, in the book and about the history. I think these issues will continue to go forward uh, as, we, as we go on. Uh, and I think one thing that in terms of national security, one thing that I'd like to point out, especially now that we're here in the Verizon Center, in this Verizon room, that's very different uh, from when, say, it was the Cold War, is communication. Now there's, there's communication and the internet that didn't exist when, when I was going to school. And I think this provides a really interesting and unique opportunity that your generation has that, that we might not have had, that we didn't have back in the day. And so I think as you're going forth, national security and international relations 
it takes on a different meaning because worlds are so much more connected and so much faster. So I think that that's something for you to kind of delve into. I would also say uh, in terms of national security and communications, you have an opportunity to share your voices around the globe in a way that others didn't 20 years ago. So I think that's a really interesting thing to, you might not realize how much of a uh, a treasure that is that uh, gives you an opportunity to share your voice all around the world and and maybe even influence international you know foreign relations national security issues just through through different platforms so that's just something to think about a different way that didn't exist back when we were uh 20 years ago no tiktok uh -huh. yeah. but movements you know different movements and uh, different you know, issues that need to be addressed, whether it's domestic or international, can be influenced by people who are holding a phone in their hand. Thank you. Meda, um, in your role, do you have any interaction with the White House Initiative on KNHPI? Um, Erica Moritsuku is a dear friend of mine, um, and so I know her personally, and. Obviously, I'd like to get plugged in with all of that. My direct role is not does not touch on that office. Can you comment on why it's important to have the diversity in the White House and and in an office like that that's influencing decisions in the White House? Yeah, obviously not not speaking for the White House, but I think that it is open to everyone that there is this office is really important for a range of reasons, especially in response to what happened during the pandemic, the rise in hate crimes, um, also understanding the lack of diversity of Asian American representation in the federal government. Um, even though so many of the decisions by the federal government impact Asian American, um, Asian Americans on a, on a daily basis. Um, I think one thing that I really appreciated about um, the current administration is also is are these like important policy discussions on inclusion and on concrete uh, steps that can be taken across the federal government. But I also appreciate the, the celebrations of culture, um, the ways that um, growing up, I didn't see, you know, Diwali being something that an average uh, student might know in, in the DMV area, let alone the North Carolina area. And so I think that exposure um, and the consolidation of that exposure through an office is really wonderful. Actually, uh, just to clarify, Erica is actually not in Wiampi. She's actually a special advisor to the president. Uh, Wiampi is actually housed in Department of Health and Human Services, where uh, Crystal Kai is the executive director for Wiampi. Um, and uh, Wiampi is very important because it coordinates a lot of the services across the federal government. Um, uh, they have their interagency working group that uh, it's not just HHS. Um, we work with the National Park Service, uh, JCL, a lot because they oversee a lot of the camps. Um, it's um, coordinating with like Department of Labor. Um, um, and actually, we're hoping that at some point we'll have our uh, a new Secretary of Labor who is Asian American, um, if the Senate can move on that. Um, or, um, or the Department of Justice obviously has been doing a lot uh, recently with um, anti-Asian hate and what, what can be done to prevent, reduce that. Um, but Erica's is actually a new position which was created um, in this administration to really coordinate a lot of um, the, the president's office and what does it do within the APA community. So it's great to have her there, obviously. Yeah, and likewise, I've known Erica for many years that um, it's uh, great to see her in that position. But, um, um, and you mentioned executive orders I and mean, the, the administration's put out so much as far as um, hiring. Um, I, mean, the, I know the people who are placed in OPM as well, but, um, I and mean, the president has really, this administration has done a lot to make sure that there are diverse people in, all across the administration. And it is making a difference. I actually have a short story about the White House initiative. I, I interned or detailed with them years ago under Kirin Ahuja, who is now the director of OPM. Uh, so cheers to, to, to her. Uh, but uh, when we were at, when I was at, at, at that time, it was WIAPI. And it was at the Department of Education. So I was there to help with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander outreach. And so one of the things that we tried to do was go to Hawaii and have a meeting with the Council of Native Hawaiian, Council of Native Hawaiian Relations, I believe, CNHR. Uh, and 
the Wiyapi had never traveled to Hawaii up until that point. Uh, and our trip was not going to be approved by, you know, upstairs, the top floor, because it was a boondoggle to go to Hawaii. And literally we had to advocate until the very last day, the next day we were leaving because we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be allowed to go. And I said, listen, the population that is the Wiyapi population is in this locale that we are going to. I said, would you approve our trip if we said we were going to Cleveland, Ohio? And yeah, that was more palatable. And so we had to advocate and we literally advocated until the day before, you know, we've set up all these meetings. And so I believe Wiyapi has been to Hawaii ever since that. So sometimes you just need to set that precedence and just open that door a little bit and then people start to see what, what needs to be done. And now it's Wiyampi. So, you know, Asian American data point. And right, right. Thank you. Okay, let's turn our attention to some of the Q and A's that we might have. Okay, first off, want to give a huge thank you to our panelists. If you could have discussion. So very quickly, before we move into our audience Q and A, we will be handing out surveys to all of our attendees. So for those of you who have QR codes in front of you, feel free to scan the QR code. We will also be handing out physical copies as well. And to our virtual attendees, I will be dropping the link for the survey in the Zoom chat very shortly. So we'll take around five minutes to take the audience survey. Your feedback is really appreciated for our sessions. And then we will move shortly into our audience Q&A for our in-person attendees. Um, feel free to raise your hand and we will pass the mic to you. For our virtual attendees, please feel free to start dropping your questions into the chat box. Thank you. 
So for those of you who are still taking um, your survey, no worries, we will collect those at the end, but wanted to kick off our audience Q&A with a question from one of our virtual attendees, Kiana. She says, how can we reckon with the complexities of working for the US government and its national security policies, given the US's history of militarization, colonization, and, and systemic racism in the Asian continent and Pacific Islands? So. This is open to any of our speakers here today. Sorry, we were actually talking. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. So oh, okay. Tiana asks, how can we reckon with the complexities of working for the US government and its national security policies, given the US's history of militarization, colonization, and systemic racism in the Asian continent and Pacific Islands? Well, I think that's why we want to be working for the U.S. government to change that history. That if we aren't a part of the system, that system is going to continue to propagate itself the way that it always has. Um, if you want to change it, get in there and change it. Um, and that's that's the thing. I, it's it's the government is big. I, it's it's not going to change immediately either. And this is where the patience that you had mentioned earlier, um, dealing with frustration and Things aren't going to go the way you always want it to, but you have to have faith that uh, um, the, that the moral arc of the universe will bend uh, towards justice. I would just have to echo, um, just echo what David said, and I think you'd be under an illusion to think you as an individual. I think you need to to recognize that it's a big. It's big, um, so you do what you can, and hopefully your work will align with others who maybe that you are like-minded and can, uh, if you're trying to work toward a, a better goal, that, that your work will come together. Um, but it's, it isn't easy, and Washington is huge with so many, I don't know why people run for president because I, I don't know that the president is the most powerful person in this city. There are so many different, you have the executive branch, the judiciary and um, you know Congress, there's so many, and not to mention the Hill, all the different senators and members of Congress, there are so many different uh, influences and different thoughts coming together. And I think the point is you want to be there and get into the fray. If you're not there, you're not there. Yeah, agreed. And I think that government is maybe not the best place for ideological purity. Um, there's a lot of compromise, a lot of trying to get to uh, get to yes in different directions and setting timelines. And like they both said, you know, you don't see your 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 work immediately, um, but you hope that you're slowly pushing the needle in certain directions. Actually, um, and the other part, of, and that's where sometimes working for like a JCL might be the better place because then you can find an organization where it does have that very specific um, area that they focus on, whether it's the ACLU talking about civil liberties or um, human rights campaign where it's uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, I, I'll, I'll actually, I'll go back to my own, um, my own personal history. Um, when I did work in the government, um, I consider myself to be a very liberal 
Democrats. Um, KCL is nonpartisan. Um, but when I did work in the government, I was working in the Bush administration. Um, but it was a great time to be there because it was the uh, rollout of the prescription drug plan, uh, Medicare Part um, B, or uh, what, what, yeah, Part D. Um, so this was, I mean, was it all the way that I wanted it to be? Probably not. But at the same time, it was something that was being rolled out and was going to be very helpful to the American people. And I was a part of that. Um, and um, being in the government, you are serving this country. Um, and that's a, that's a very important thing. Um, at least I think so. So we have two more questions from our virtual attendees, and then we can turn to our in-person attendees for any questions. So the first one is, do panelists have any insight on how their roles or our communities have been impacted by the rise of Sinophobia in recent years as we see a fight to ban TikTok the app while seeing a rise in popularity of K-pop and Korean culture, for example? I'm gonna defer to David on this one. <laughs> It does create kind of an interesting um, juxtaposition um, that, and we do talk about um, sort of like the lunchbox moment. I mean, growing up, um, I would never have thought to bring Japanese or Chinese food to school because, yeah, I would have been mocked mercilessly. Um, but now you've got, I and mean, sushi is a normal thing. Um, and I actually hated sushi when I was a little kid. <laughs> um, but not, at the same time, I still see my own son, like he brought um, Japanese curry to lunch um, once at school. And one of his classmates says, you're eating poop. <laughs> it's sort of like those lunchbox moments are still happening. So there is that perpetual foreigner aspect of being Asian American. And that's where we all need to work to try and change that narrative. Um, and that's when COVID kind of broke out. Um, and that's pretty much what all of us here in Washington, D.C. got together. It was and JCL, OCA, um, Advancing Justice. I and mean, we were all talking about how do we change the narrative here? Um, but the problem there is that you, have a pre you had a president who had the bully pulpit and was able to kind of set the narrative. And that was to reinforce that uh, foreignness um, of Asian Americans. Um, so a lot of it is basically trying to combat that and trying to create that narrative that yes, we are Americans. Uh, we still maintain a lot of the um, aspects of our, our, uh, our ethnic heritage, uh, but that doesn't make us any less American. And how do we make sure that that is a part of our story? And that's, that's really been the struggle for Japanese Americans ever since the war. I mean, that, that really was where um, and when you talked about military service, I mean, let's prove our patriotism by serving the military. Um, that didn't do it. Um, I and mean, rejecting our Japanese heritage, that still didn't do it. I mean, we were still perceived as being the foreigner. And it's, it's an ongoing fight, but we need to keep chipping away at it and hope that at some point we can be fully embraced as American. So our um, question from our virtual attendee Zita says that this question is directed to Tanya. First, thank you for the work that you do. It is always inspiring to see PIs advocating for the islands. As someone who is tomorrow, it is comforting to hear that there are spaces that acknowledge us and people who are fighting for our representation from the higher level. And so she asks, my question is, do you think there are any practical ways of addressing the problems on the islands, rampant militarism, conservation, colonization, and do you have any suggestions of how we can be involved in that work? Uh, thank you first, Hafadeh, and see you, Smasi, to you, uh, to, to, to our, our question, questioner. Uh, your question is, a, is really, it's a huge one. Uh, I think it ties into to everything that we've been talking today. I don't, I don't know, you're a student probably, so uh, I would just recommend, uh, you know, being involved with where, where you are at your level, if you are at school, being involved, being informed. Uh, I mentioned uh, social media. I mentioned communications and how it's changed and the internet. So I think potentially if you're in, in, in an organization that's uh, an activist organization or you're trying to promote ideas and, and get them out there, you have 
uh, communication tools uh, that maybe you can use. Uh, and I would say use your networks also. If you have uh, schools and alums, if you have ways to work with the government, with your local government, uh, work through that. If you have opportunities to work with federal agencies that are in your islands, uh, they are constantly looking, at least the folks that I work with are constantly looking for, for ways to incorporate, to include more Pacific Islanders. In fact, uh, literally just a couple of weeks ago, this is with the National Parks, uh, National Park Service, and they are looking for ways to increase their Pacific Islanders in the territories. Uh, we didn't quite get to Pacific Islanders in the U.S., but in the territories in this community volunteer ambassador program. So people are trying to reach out and, and, and get more folks involved so that there is more representation. So keep an eye out for that. Google it, look on the internet, see what ag agencies and organizations such as JACL, what are they doing, such as PayPal, what are they doing? How are they promoting that pathway? Uh, so look into that. And, um, and then maybe just a, you know, a, a campaign for, for our Office of Insular Affairs. Keep an out, out, look out for our office. And if there's ever an opening for work, uh, consider coming to work in Washington, DC. Uh, I know it's far away. I know some of my coll colleagues who are in the Pacific Islands uh, just don't have the patience to be in DC. You know, sometimes I think, what am I doing here? I'd rather be in the islands, but uh, sometimes you, you do need to kind of reach out and, and go in, into places where maybe you're not completely comfortable. And I appreciated uh, Metha's point about uh, purity. Uh, it's, there are times to, to be pure in, in, and absolute in what you think, uh, but there are many times where compromise is what, what makes the needle move forward. Uh, and I think we don't, we don't mention that enough and, and we need to work together. I mentioned having allies. You'd be surprised where you find your allies. Uh, one thing in the Office of Insular Affairs of the Department of the Interior and other offices, the president changes more or less every year and you have to, you have to work with those policies. So if somebody is presenting a policy that maybe in your work is just completely, you know, maybe you have a chance to, to speak up about it and mention or talk about other perspectives that might be helpful in changing or modifying. But if I were to just get mad and walk out and leave the room or leave the job, then I, I wouldn't, I would lose those opportunities to, to share a different perspective. So uh, hopefully that was helpful to you. Uh, that's a really huge question. And hopefully uh, I helped with some, and, and I think in general from this panel and my, my other colleagues here, you'll, you'll, you'll find more of your answers. Actually, something you mentioned was about the local government, which um, is very different from federal governments, um, that oftentimes there is more, less of the ide ideology that happens locally, that the goal is to actually get things done. Um, Unfortunately, that can also work against us. I mean, we're seeing a lot of things happening locally right now that are really opposing the APA community, like in uh, Florida, where they just passed an alien land law. Um, Texas was trying to do one where we're seeing what's happening with schools and things. Um, but it's also very important that you're active in those fights as well, that it's not just all at the federal policy, that there is a lot of things happening locally as well, and you need to be aware of that. All right, so for any of our in-person attendees, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and then we will pass the mic over to you. So I see that we have some in the second row, third row. Um, okay. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. It's really inspiring to hear all of your stories. Um, this is a question more to David and Tanya because uh, I admire kind of your roles as advocates and representatives for the communities that you represent, so Japanese Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, but it's kind of, to me, it's a bit daunting to have so many people relying on you to represent them. And there's such a wide variety of experiences and beliefs and ideas. How do you shoulder that responsibility, both a burden and a privilege to represent such a large number of people who you know, are worth fighting for? I think um, one of the things I think for JCL, we have about 8,000 members. That's compared to what, about 2 million people who identify as Japanese American now in this country. So I don't really represent Japanese Americans necessarily. Um, and JCL doesn't really 
purport to represent Japanese Americans as a monolithic group. And, that, and we can't, um, we don't. Um, and I think if you were to find some people who have um, called me angrily and canceled their memberships, um, you would find that we do not represent some of their views. Um, what, we, what we are trying to represent is um, sort of a story of what has happened to Japanese Americans and why is that story relevant to um, many of the civil rights issues that are coming up today and um, that this history does persist and it's not just history that it, uh, we are seeing the same types of xenophobia continue to rise up and yes at some point um, perhaps we, I would love that there is no need for a JCL there's no need for any of these types of groups because we will overcome a lot of these um, prejudices that do exist but unfortunately human nature kind of is that way. And I think that there's always gonna be a need for organizations like us to exist, to, to represent and to stand up. Um, yes, is do I feel the weight of it sometimes? Yes, but I think that we all feel that weight. I mean, that's part of being from a community like this, that we all carry that weight. Um, so, I don't feel like what I'm carrying is any different from what any of you probably are also feeling at times. So um, you could also be in this position. <laughs> Thanks for that question. And I'd have to echo what David said is that I, I don't see myself as the represent, you know, representative of, of, of the, the everyone. Um, but there are issues that come up in the daily work, you know, in, in our offices where, where it, it it is good to have a perspective, to give a different perspective, and maybe a perspective from the other side of the table that might be, but but I still do work in the government. So it's not that I can, you know, I'm not an activist for, you know, I'm not in an activist role. And I think sometimes my fellow Pacific Islanders who are in activist roles would rather I, I do something different, uh, you know, more, more activist, <laughs> more dressed, more, more energetic, let's put it that way. Um, so, so it is a different role. It's a slightly different role um, to what to, to what David uh, said. And even for JCL, I mean, we probably are not as um, active as some people would like us to be. But uh, compromise was mentioned. Um, JCL strongly believes that we would rather get a small win than have no win. Um, that um, we we will sometimes as you might say, throw somebody under the bus. Um, I mean, it happened with redress when we had our biggest legislative win of our organization's history. Um, there were some groups that were excluded from getting redress um, or their redress was reduced, um, specifically the Japanese Latin Americans. Um, so there are decisions that we oftentimes have to make that um, might infuriate do keep me up. It's like, where do we make these decisions of what's an acceptable compromise um, to try and make some progress? Or do we just stand pat and say, look, it's either all or nothing. Hi. Um, firstly, I would like to thank all of you for all the amazing work that you are doing. And my question is that now that, you know, we see USA and China uh, you know, engaging in this race for capturing regional influence in different pockets of the world, it is very much possible that the public and the media may dub this as the second Cold War. And with that, my question is, how can the Asian Pacific Caucus make sure that, you know, um, if, if we dub this era as the second Cold War, how can we make sure that we can mitigate the possibility of Asian Americans, particularly East Asian, uh, being subject to not just hatred and violence, but also being prone to distrust in spaces like high schools or college campuses. Yeah, and that's all part of that whole narrative of um, how do we educate people about, yes, there is a difference between some the Chinese government and someone who is Chinese American or Asian American that's, um, 
we are American and we have chosen to be in this country. We are proud of our citizenship um, and we shouldn't have to be proving our loyalty. Um, and um, those are the stories that we need to really make sure that people are aware of. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes it gets into sort of like the model minority aspects as well. Um, that um, unfortunately the Japanese American community did really embrace the whole model minority story coming out of the war. It's like, look at it, look at Japanese Americans, what we, we overcame the, the incarceration experience, but that also does help to create um, that narrative that yes, we are fully American. Um, so again, it's this tightrope that we're always trying to balance of um, what's, what's putting forth a good narrative, but not to the point where we are damaging to other members of our community um, as well. Maybe just one thing that I would add to David's points is, is that we're all human and um, social in social studies, they show that the more you know of someone or have an experience with a story, you know, you met someone from a different background, the less likely, the more likely you're going to be uh, more understanding of that culture. So that I guess would point to get out there. It may be uncomfortable sometimes to be the only Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander in the room or in a in a place, but uh, you know, get out there um, <clears throat> and be be an ambassador, be an ambassador for your your group and um, help to share share your story. I think people just want to hear. People love. I love stories. I don't know if any of you. I love stories. I love to hear stories about different people and what they've done. And so I think, you know, that kind of points back to just get out there, be involved as much as you can. It's not always going to be easy and you will have bad days, uh, but you will have good days too. I, I also immediately thought of representation, but one thing that we've talked about a little bit before is about politics at different levels. So mentioned different states having more aggressive uh, views on immigrants and things like that and thinking about, well, where, where would my place be in that? So um, thinking about not just federal government engagement, but local groups, interest groups that have national influence. All right, so I think, um, let's see, it's 7.30 now. So I think that's it for questions, but to everyone who does have um, remaining questions in the audience, feel free to ask our panelists after the session as well. But I will now hand it over to Denise to close us out. Okay, well, thank you, Tanya and David and Metha for your thoughtful conversation. Uh, wonderful. We've gotten some great feedback and um, some very thoughtful insights from the questions that were asked. And we thank everyone here and on um, the virtual um, uh, virtual arena also to join us tonight, whether you're here with us or, or joining us virtually. If you enjoyed our third WLP session of the summer, we've got three more sessions still for the year. WLPs are every Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, both in person in DC and virtually via Zoom. Next week's WLP is Pacific Islander Indigeneity and the Environment, where we'll talk about issues impacting the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, particularly around environmental developments, impact of tourism, and the intersection between identity and the, and the environment. You can register on our website at kapal.org and view all of our upcoming events. Follow us on social media again, and to learn more about our uh, uh, scholar and internship and programs are all our programs um, at Kapal DC. Thank you to our 2023 sponsors, Moapia, Comcast, and Bonafide Mass for your continued support of our programs and continue to provide opportunities for AANHPI and public service. And a very special thank you, thank you to the incredible staff of Verizon, I think they're still here, uh, for allowing us to host our WLP series in your venue space. Thank you for attending our third WLP session of the summer. We'll see you next week, good night. And for those of you staying here tonight, we look forward to some networking. <laughs>